Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming out at 8.15 in the morning. Uh, we had to get started early. Um, there's a first-time symposium that's being put on at the UW Law School, uh, led by the realtors and others, and uh, we're really looking forward to going over to that. Adam and I are going to be presenters over there um, this morning. So um, we had to start at 8.15, and hope everybody's up and at them. Uh, Pleasure to be with Representative Jarko here to talk about the Homeowners Bill of Rights. It was about a year ago that Adam and I were over on the west side of the state, over in the village of Bay City, to talk about some uh, what we believe was eminent domain abuse. And we wanted to put the thought out about protecting people's property rights. Um, if you look at the home builders data that is out nationally, 25% of the cost of building a new home now is in regulations. Just think about that. A quarter of the cost of building a new home is simply regulations. And you wonder why people cannot afford to get into that starter home, why low-income people oftentimes cannot even afford to be able to um, get in a home these days. And a lot of that is due to regulations. And we think that it's time for the legislature here in the state of Wisconsin to lead on this issue of um, home ownership, uh, regulatory reform as it surrounds property rights. And I would say a, an ancillary issue to this is privacy also. Um, I put it as a two-piece, privacy and property rights, and that's what we're trying to address with this Homeowners Bill of Rights. Um, I believe 
that the courts have fallen down. We're going to hear from the Murr family here uh, in a few minutes. And uh, uh, we believe that the courts, both state and federal, have um, kind of fallen down on this issue. But also, we in the legislature have not taken up the mantle also over the last number of decades in protecting people's property rights, which is really at the foundation of that privacy, but also prosperity. Because without protecting property rights, people do not have the certainty that they can do to make investment back decisions. And so that's what we seek to do here. And we uh, seek to be leaders here in the United States, right here in Wisconsin, in advancing people's property rights. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Representative Jarko. And it's just a real privilege to be with all these great people here, the Murr family, John Groen from the Pacific Legal Foundation, and our colleagues in the legislature that have chosen uh, to join us here today. Adam. Thanks. Well, it's always gratifying to be here with folks from Western Wisconsin. So first, I want to thank the Murr family so much for taking the time to drive all the way down here. People don't recognize it takes three and a half to four hours to drive down here. So these folks made a long trip, some, some early this morning, some last night. And you know they are a great example of what is wrong with property rights. They're a great example of why uh, we can't simply depend on the courts to deal with these issues. The courts, as I said in a public hearing yesterday, the courts set an outer box of the Constitution. Outside of that box, we cannot regulate because it's unconstitutional. But within that box, there's a lot of room to regulate. And I think what, where we're regulating today is just too far, too much over the line. And so we're going to, with these proposals, ratchet that back a little bit. Uh, the MERS are a great example, and this package addresses that issue that they've dealt with. It addresses the conditional use permit problems that we've seen, uh, regulatory takings, variances, and then it addresses what, what Senator Tiffany talked about, home affordability, which I think is incredibly important and something that we haven't paid enough attention to. It also addresses privacy and, and security. I mean, one of the things that you probably won't hear much about, but I think is really important for rural Wisconsin, is we're going to make sure in the spring when the road bans goes on, go on that people can actually get propane at their house. So we, we address a number of things from property rights to home affordability to privacy to energy security in, in this package of bills. I'm really, really excited about it, but mostly I'm excited to have the Murr family here and John Grone from the Pacific Legal Foundation who represented the Murr family at the United States Supreme Court and did a heck of a job. Came up a little short, uh, unfortunately, but the good thing about being in the, in the legislature is we get to, to fix those kind of issues and I'm looking forward to it. So uh, John, if you wanna come up and say a few words. Thank you. Well, Pacific Legal Foundation is, is proud to be here today uh, with all of you uh, standing in unity to, to support private property rights and to correct the errors that are made in the courts. Uh, it's a system where we do have courts to protect constitutional rights, but when the courts fail in that, uh, it's, it's the right procedure to then turn to the legislature and change the statutes and protect those rights that are important to everyone. So PLF is proud to be here and we are right now uh, launching, and it starts right here in Wisconsin, launching an effort nationwide to undo the injustice that has been perpetrated against the MERS. Uh, the, the MERS had a vacant parcel that they purchased and paid taxes on for several decades. It's a separate and distinct parcel. And they were denied the ability to make any use of that parcel at all or to sell it to anyone. And the reason they were denied that is because they happened to own the parcel next door. If anyone else had owned this particular parcel, they could have sold or developed it. But because the MERS owned another parcel, the court said, well, you have enough economic use with the cabin on your other parcel, so you can be denied all use of the separate parcel without compensation. We think that undermines private property rights and undermines the purpose of the takings clause, which is to provide fairness and justice for all. Fairness and justice was denied for the MERS. And so that's why we're here today uh, with them uh, and, and with Senator Tiffany and Representative Jarko and, and others to support this legis legislation. It's an important piece of legislation and uh, one that we hope is passed. So with that, I want to turn it over to Donna Murr and her family, and, uh, and we'll also be taking questions. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you to the Pacific Legal Foundation and to Adam and to Tom for this great opportunity. Less than a month ago, on June 23rd, was a pretty big day for our family. That's when the U.S. Supreme Court decided five to three against us. 
And for a very short period of time, I was quite devastated, disheartened, disappointed in that decision. But about four hours after learning that decision, Adam reached out to me. And Adam said, Donna, we're going to fix this injustice. And the phrase that came into my head was, when one door closes, another door opens. And it was a very significant turning point in our family's lives because it's not over yet. And one of our goals throughout this whole process wasn't just to make a difference for our family and correct things for us, but it's to correct and help other Americans. We had hoped to do that on a national level at the Supreme Court. Um, since we weren't successful there, we're going to try our best, working with Adam and Tom and the group, to make a difference here in Wisconsin. So um, thank you for continuing to bring out the awareness of these issues. I think that's important that people understand what's happened and how we can't take our property rights for granted. And so, I, again, I'd like to thank you all for, for covering the story and for your continued interest. Yeah, with that, um, we'd be happy to take any questions. Um, MERS, John from Pacific Legal, Adam and myself, uh, we'd be happy to take any questions that um, the press may have. Has the bill already been introduced, and where is it in the process right now? Uh, so there's two bills uh, in this part of the package. We've also called a couple of other bills that have been introduced part of the package, but today we're going to circulate for co-sponsorship two bills. One of them is a, a property rights bill, and one of them is a home affordability bill. What do the bills actually do? Uh, well, so there's uh, a number of things that each bill does. Uh, the most important part of the property rights bill is it fixes the the MER issue by grandfathering substandard lots. It prohibits those merger provisions. It provides standards with respect to conditional use permits so that if you buy a property that's uh, zoned as a conditional use, you can actually make use of that property so long as you meet the conditions. It provides certainty with respect to non-conforming structures and variances. On the home affordability side, we actually do something that I think is pretty creative and I'm, I'm really looking forward to our colleagues' uh, comments on it. We, we create a new form of TIF district called a workforce uh, TIF district for workforce housing. Um, and I think it's pretty innovative. It'll be really interesting to see how, how that pans out. We also, because as we're going through the budget process, we don't know what's gonna happen with the forestry mill tax. We put the repeal of the forestry mill tax in this bill. We put the uh, certainty with respect to propane deliveries in the spring in this bill, um, and a number of other things. So those are the sort of the, the basics that they do. Yeah, and I'm just gonna um, go a little bit deeper in one issue that's real near and dear to me that Adam mentioned is conditional use reform. I think that's one of the most significant parts of this package. We're seeing the conditional use process being abused at the local level, where you see applicants are filing for a permit and they meet all of the conditions, and yet they're denied the permit, oftentimes under the heading of health, safety, and welfare. And it's one of the places where it's, it's interesting. The state of Minnesota is really light years ahead of us on this issue. Their case law in Minnesota is very firm on this. If you meet the conditions uh, um, under a conditional use permit, you automatically receive the permit if you've met those conditions. We do not do that in Wisconsin, and that really leads to great uncertainty for property owners. Um, and there's a number of cases that um, we can cite to show that, including the Rainbow Springs uh, case. Um, how does a TIF district address the regulatory burden of new home construction? So what, what we're trying to do is figure out a way to lower the cost of entry-level housing. So what we define as workforce housing meets some specific income criteria um, and cost criteria, and, it, and it, it limits the initial upfront cost of building that home through, you know, of course, the, the normal TIF procedure, plus what we do is limit some of the impact fees if the, if the local government decides that they want to go along with, with putting this uh, TIF into place. So we think it can uh, reduce, at least to some extent, the cost of workforce housing. So is the bill going to allow the MERS to sell their vacant lot? Uh, certainly that's, that's the intent. So what we would do here is grandfather uh, all substandard lots and prevent lot merger provisions. And so that's what they're operating under now is lot merger provisions. So if, if this bill is signed into law, I think that, that that could be a possibility. And I don't know if that's their plan or if they plan to develop it or what their plan is. 
<laughs> what is the national implications for that if you, with this bill, if they're allowed to sell their lot? Go ahead, John, step up. It preserves private property rights. When someone purchases a separate and distinct lot, their normal expectation, the reasonable expectation, is that when you have a deed to that lot and it has a legal description and meets and bounds, you are entitled to use that lot for a reasonable use. The merger provision takes that right away. By blocking the merger provision, it restores the right that initially was in the lot as a separate, saleable, developable parcel. Well, that ordinance predated their inheritance of the lot, didn't it? The, uh, uh, the purchase of the lots were in 1960 and in 1963. The ordinance came into effect in 1975. This is not a situation where uh, a third party comes in and purchases the property uh, and goes through a process of reviewing all kinds of subsequent legislation. This is property that was always within the family. Okay. So what are the national implications for others in this situation when they're in the scenic riverways? If you pass this bill, you set precedent here, and now you can fight this back in the Supreme Court, or? Well, it doesn't work that way. This is legislation for Wisconsin, and so we'll address the situation in Wisconsin. Other states would have to enact their own laws to deal with it. Uh, meanwhile, on the other front, we will continue uh, to battle in the courts. The problem that has happened is the court has uh, come up with this multi-factor analysis to determine what is property. And our view is property is property, and we all know and understand what property is. And, and the court's recent decision has, has <coughs> instead grounded it in expectations and taken a, a very different view of what the MERS expected with their parcel. But isn't this sort of an outlier case given that they want to sell a lot within the scenic riverway? Well, I don't know what you mean by an outlier case, but it's simply a situation of government system. regulation of private property. And regardless of what the public purposes are, if government regulation reaches too far and has too much of an economic impact on a property owner, that is a taking of private property. And in fact, the greater the government purposes, the more fairness and justice would suggest that the government should pay for the economic impacts of achieving that greater public good. That's what uh, that principle of fairness and justice and not shifting public burdens solely onto individuals, that's been the founding of the Takings Clause for, for many years now. And that principle of fairness and justice is undermined by shifting the economic burden onto just the MERS. Todd, can I follow up on that uh, question a little bit? Um, I think the Scenic Rivers Act um, perhaps was the impetus for the county board to move in the direction that they did to deem those lots as being merged. Um, but specifically to your question, we want to fix what's in Wisconsin. That's what we do with this bill. And then um, will other states follow us? We don't know that, but hopefully they will. But this issue of substandard lots goes far beyond the MERS. And that's why the bill is all encompassing in terms of if you have a lot that was legally recognized when you purchase it, you should be able to develop it within those, uh, within the uh, regulations. And while the Murr family has been so determined to get justice, there are so many families that are out there that they've said, we are not going to fight, we're not going to fight City Hall, so to speak, because they know how expensive it is. And you don't hear about the dozens, if not hundreds of stories out there of people who have had substandard lots that they just said, well, okay, I guess we're simply not gonna be able to develop because we will not fight. And it's time for us to take up that mantle. And uh, the MERS are just a great example of uh, what we're trying to fix here. And it should be kept in mind that uh, any development you know, still has to comply with all of the other requirements of development. The term substandard is just a term of art. There's, th this is over an acre of property. There's a beautiful, large, about a half acre space for development that complies with all the environmental requirements that's available. 
If anyone else owned the lot, they can develop it today. It's only the MERS who cannot. So this is not a situation where development is going to cause some kind of adverse impact. It com a development on lot E would comply with all the environmental requirements and all the setbacks, everything. Have you guys spoken with leadership and is, the, is this on track to be part of the fall agenda? Um, yes, I have spoken to leadership and uh, they're excited to see these bills and um, but you'll have to consult with them to see exactly where they're at at this point. Um, put it this way, they know that these bills are coming and um, um, as happens in the Senate with any legislation like this, the majority leader makes it clear to us, if you can get 17 votes, we will pass it. So that's my job on the Senate side is to get, the, get majority support for the bills and that's what we hope to do over the next few months. Yeah, I would, I would say the same thing. The leadership is aware of these bills. I think, generally speaking, our caucus uh, has been a, a pretty strong supporter of property rights in the last number of years. So I would echo Tom. I mean, the, the leader and the, uh, the speaker his tells us if we get 50 votes, uh, typically we can get that bill up. And so I would expect that it's my job to get the 50 votes, and then we'll get it up for a vote, hopefully, this fall. Have either of you spoken with the governor? Um, um, I have let the governor's office know that this would be coming. Um, I spoke to their office um, last year when we talked about the Homeowners Bill of Rights. Really haven't uh, spoken in depth with them, but they do know that it's coming. Tom, you, you mentioned that there were numerous cases where CUPs were denied. You mentioned the Rainbow Springs case. What is that? Um, so the Rainbow Springs case was a development here in southern Wisconsin where they were going to build a um, golf course, various things like that. It was a, a pretty comprehensive development. And they had a building burned down. And I don't, I can get you more detail on it, um, but they, um, uh, their conditional use permit was pulled as a result of them not acting on uh, replacement of a building that burned down in time. The local zoning administrator said you need to get this done promptly. They did not act in time and therefore the full conditional use permit was pulled from them. I can get you more detail on that. They got the CUP and it was revoked? Yes. Okay. Do you have any other instances of people who could not even get the CUP? Well, there was a recent case that was settled by the um, state Supreme Court in regards to all energy versus Trempolo County. Um, most people believe they met all the conditions of their permit and their permit was denied. So those are a couple examples, but it has a real chilling effect um, when uh, you do not have the certainty that you meet the conditions that are laid out for you and then do not receive the permit. I think we need to go to the law school. Yeah, okay. Thanks so much, and uh, stop in and contact our offices if you need any follow-up information. We'd be happy to share that with you. And um, we're so pleased that the Murr family chose to came down and come down and join us today, along with uh, counsel from the Pacific Legal Foundation. And uh, we really look forward to advancing these bills through the fall session. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for a second. I'm Laurel. I'm a Wisconsin Public Radio. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you. 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 Thank